Hello everyone, it's Dr. Sam. I'd like to welcome you to my Eye Clarity Podcast. This is a show that offers cutting edge information on how to improve your vision and overall wellness through holistic methods. I so appreciate you spending part of your day with me. If you have questions, you can send them to hello at drsamburn.com. Now to the latest Eye Clarity episode. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Sam and I'd like to welcome you to another Eye Clarity podcast. So we have an interesting show today. I'm going to be counseling some parents who have a 16-year-old son and he was diagnosed in his left eye with a condition called keratoconus. Now keratoconus, another way to describe that is a bulging of the cornea. It's one of the most common corneal dystrophies out there. What happens is the cornea begins to thin and there's a protrusion that takes on a conical shape and this creates a distortion of light that comes into the eyes that creates blurred vision, astigmatism, sometimes myopia. And the thing to note about the cornea is there are six layers of the cornea. And the cornea is made up of mostly a connective tissue called collagen. And I talk a lot about collagen and MSM and some of the reasons why keratoconus occurs is because there's a buildup of the fluid in one of the layers of the uh, the corneal layers, uh, actually the Bowman's layer of the cornea. And this can create things like oxidative damage, free radicals that start forming on the cornea. And some of the causes can be Obviously, genetics is a big piece. Oxidative stress, as I said, inflammation, allergies. Magnesium deficiencies is actually a big cause of keratoconus. Also, conditions like diabetes, thyroid imbalances. But basically, the low magnesium level is one of the key issues. Down syndrome is another place I've seen keratoconus, respiratory conditions like sleep apnea, asthma, and even other retinal conditions like retinitis pigmentosa or Leber's disease. If you do a lot of chronic rubbing, this can accelerate the keratoconus. So in this particular session, The parents, this is what happened. The parents took their son for the motor vehicles exam, you know, the eye test, and he couldn't see anything out of his left eye. And that was the first thing that, uh, you know, the first time that they saw that this was going to be a problem. So they went to an ophthalmologist and he diagnosed this, this person with keratoconus and wanted to do something called corneal cross-linking. And now this is a procedure that uh, is used to mitigate some of the corneal dystrophy. And I talk about cross-linking at the beginning of the session because the, the parents are, are really concerned What the doctor has said is that the left eye is completely gone. And so he wants to do the procedure corneal cross-linking on the good eye. And they're befuddled by that because the good eye is doing well. Why risk any side effects by doing this corneal cross-linking? So this is the first part of the session 
where I talk about this. So here we go. Um, the thing with corneal cross-linking, as you probably know, they use a, a riboflavin, a B2, um, and it's, a, it's an eye drop, and then they use a UV light. And um, those uh, combinations can stabilize the, the corneal dystrophy. And the thing is, is the part of, part of vision is in the brain. It isn't just in the eyes. Um, I would say, you know, part of vision is 50% is probably in the brain. It may even be higher. And one of the things to consider from a functional point of view would be to try the scleral contact lens and see how much improvement you could get in the left eye and see if you could then maybe do some, this is a different way than the surgeons, but do some kind of functional physical eye therapy where you're getting the brain and the two eyes to work together. And then maybe you could do more proactive, natural kinds of things. There are eye drops, there's nutrition and dietary things. Um, and also, because he's on the screen to do everything you can to uh, minimize the blue light emission because blue light has a negative effect on the corneas because it dries it out. Um, I don't know if blue light was even talked about around the screens, but believe me, it does. It's like being at a tanning salon, except at a tanning salon, you're there for a few minutes but I would get a screen protector and I could help you get something to protect on the screen. And then maybe even a pair of glasses that uh, would also block the blue light. But because of all that screen exposure, but that's not helping the, the situation. Um, and I would be more conservative because the, the cornea surgeries and the cornea procedures they don't have a, a super high success rate, say compared to like a cataract surgery. And you're also dealing with after that scar tissue in the cornea. Now there are systemic things that you can do to reduce scar tissue in the eye. There are digestive enzymes and you know things like that um, that I could help you with. But I would enter any procedure very, very cautiously. And I don't think I would do anything with the right eye. Um, I might try some of these other natural like eye drops and things that I can introduce you to and then do these other other things as well that I'm suggesting. You know, the surgeon, that's how he makes his money. It's easy. That's what he offers. But it's pretty aggressive and pretty invasive. And um, the results are not you know, bulletproof. They're not, I'm sure if you talk to his patients, you might get a 40 to 50% success rate, maybe, but there's more distortion you're dealing with. Uh, so, and I would say right now, your your son's brain is probably just looking through his right eye. That's probably, That's and he's suppressing doing. the information yeah. in, in the left eye because of that blurry. So when you get the scleral lens, that would give the left eye more stimulation, more clarity, more input, so it would work with the right eye. I think that would be my first option. I would do the scleral lens and see how much usable vision he's getting out of the left eye, and then do some of these more conservative, proactive things, maybe doing, doing some little physical therapy, things I could show you that you could do with him. Um, and then, getting that protection on the screen, and then wait and see. All right, in this next segment, the parents are asking me about the risk to reward of the corneal surgery. So here's my response. It's too risky, and um, the surgery is just not, you know, as I said, the results are very iffy. It's, and you're going to have side effects from that surgery, more dryness, more scarring, different kinds of cloudiness, fluctuations. With a keratoconus, you're dealing with also 
uh, a prescription that has what we call astigmatism. And astigmatism means that there's another blur that's going on due to the distortion of the shape of the cornea. So when the light goes into the retina, it's distorting that light in another kind of a way. And, you know, a scleral lens can correct for some of that astigmatism. And um, I, I would try that first. I mean, you, you go get the go get the opinion, see how you feel about it. But in these medical situations, parents trust your gut. Trust your gut, and I'm with you on it. In that, um, I've seen too many car wrecks where these these guys are aggressively going in and doing these kinds of, you know, procedures. And it's not I like doing a cataract surgery where you know you're you're controlling the variables. In in this kind of surgery, it's hard to control all the variables. And the more variables that you can't control, the more chances you have of of creating some problems. So that's that's where it's at. So get the opinion. You can even send me, you know, what he says. But I would not touch the right eye. I would leave it alone. 2030 is good enough acuity. He even passes driver's test with that. Yeah. Um, maybe there is a corrective lens he could wear if you go to a good optometrist and say, just correct his eyesight for distance with some lenses. I know could, he's got this condition, could, but um, yeah. go ahead. No, you go. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just going to write down my question so I don't forget it. But no, you finish. Sorry. Um, so in other words, going to somebody just to get what we call a refraction and a refraction means what's the best optical correction you can give me, uh, based on my situation and a contact lens is the way to go because it sits on the eyeball. So you're going to get better optics and less distortion spectacles because they're further away from the eye. Um, it's not going to be able to correct or fit on the cornea, you know, cause it's so far away from the eye. So contacts would be the way to go. And you're looking at a, a hard, hard lens or a scleral lens, or, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of great technology out there in terms of the, the contact lens world. And I would definitely go there first. If you could get some improvement in the acuity in the left eye, that would be a winning situation. So in this next section, I talk about referrals to a big eye center. You know, Bascom Palmer, which is in Miami, these folks are from Florida. I recommended that they go there and they actually made an appointment because they see everything and they would be equipped to be able to handle this keratoconus situation. So here is the... Uh, Here's my feedback that, um, you know, these big eye centers all have cornea topographies. You know, there's the, the, um, the Balmer Institute. That's where, yeah, we're, going. That's where we're going. We're going to Miami. Yeah. They, that's, that's the pre, that's where I would go. If that's I had this condition, going. Forget, going, forget going to these other people. Um, cause the Balmer, they've got the research, they've got the specialists, they've got the experience Yeah, and you could, what you could do is you could get the corneal topography and then you could send it to me and then I could interpret it. You know, they're going to give you a good interpretation too, but that's the way to monitor it is just to get, you know, it's kind of like somebody's got a condition, you get the scan, you get the x-ray, you get the MRI, you get the, and the corneal topography is, is the ticket so that that would allow you to see okay, what's the baseline? And then maybe doing some of these interventions. And then in three months, you can get a set. And then you've got some data that you can compare. Whoever is fitting it, so this is, you want to make sure whoever is fitting it, fitting it, they have a good support staff and they've got the experience. You know, when I had my office in Santa Fe, um, I had a, a contact lens technician that I hired and trained and she worked with all the kids who learned how to insert and remove contacts. And so you just need to have a good contact lens technician 
um, in the practice of where you go, go so that they can work with him. Okay. And it, it's a skill of just learning how to insert and remove. And, yeah. you know, you need to learn how to do it too. But, yeah. you know, he's 16. I, I think he can, I think he can yeah, manage it. They're also, and then, yeah, he, he's going to want to learn how to do it. Obviously, it's going to bring his sight back. So that, that's a good you know, and here's, here's his hot button. Two things. You got to learn to do this so you can drive. Oh, okay. I'm motivated now. And you got to learn to do this so you can do your life's work, which is video games. I have a lot of kids yeah, who like video. So you got to hit his hot button. Uh, you got to find ways to motivate him. Um, I, I do work with a lot of Spectrum kids because I uh, I work at a place called Kid Power in Albuquerque and worked with them for 30 years. So I'm very, that's why I asked you about it because I've worked with a lot of these kids, high level, low level, cerebral palsy, brain injury, high level autistic. And, you know, you've, you've got to, there's an intuitive thing that I do with these kids, which is kind of meeting them where they are and not trying to impose some heavy thing on them at the beginning, but also getting them to buy in. And um, once they buy in and... I'm intuitively kind of tuning in where, okay, where can we start here? They open up like a flower, you know, whereas if you go to somebody, you know, that's just very dogmatic and you're doing it my way and there's no intuitive side of it, then yeah, you know, you're not going to get them to buy in. So you're going to have to kind of scope that out and it may not be a doctor, it may be a, a, you know, one of the technicians in the office, I mean, I would take a look at Balmer and see what their what their process is around the scleral lens. That by going to Bascom and Palmer, you're going to the best place. And you're going to get an experience there that um, is going to be first class. You know, I mean you might get some information that you don't want to hear, or I, I don't know, you might get something that, oh, this is better. But as I, as I have worked with Bascom and Palmer, because I used to be from the East Coast, I was always very impressed with the ophthalmologists that um, I talked to, and they see this all the time. Um, keratoconus is one of the many things that they that they look at. And so you'd be going to the best. And I think at this point, you know, if you started with somebody else, um, this other person doesn't look like, you know, he's immersed in it. Like he doesn't even have uh, a, a website uh, of any kind. Yeah, and he didn't have you a website. Know, I, I noticed that too. Yeah. I did. There's, there's a little, there's a little one, but um, you know, I've been at this a while and, and I, I look at, you know, like on social media and so on, uh, I look at people and their passion and their interest, they're, they're, they're showing me something um, online. There's an online um, set of information and it kind of tells me the, the tone. I, I'm not getting a clear tone from this person, which tells me that, is he dabbling in it? Is he is he specializing in it? I don't really know. And this is this is something you want to get right, and you want to get it right the first time if you can. Yeah. And I, I think agree. your best chance would be that makes sense too. Yeah. Um, it, it is a really good place where they can they can handle. They've seen all kinds of things like this. In this next segment, I talk about what nutritional things that you can do to support your cornea health. I mean, here's the thing, you know, B vitamins are very important for the cornea. Omega-3 is very important for the cornea. Uh, you, can't, you can't get that from, uh, you know, you can't create that. You've got a, usually a supplement. Um, so here's where you have to be out of the box on this and see what you want to do, because maybe it's just the scleral lens and forget about it. But Forget these these uh, allopathic people and look for like 
a functional medicine person or a naturopathic, somebody that could do an analysis on his biochemistry. Yeah. Like we do something called a hair mineral analysis. And that, not so much a blood test because that's not going to tell you much. But somebody who can look at his whole biochemistry, trace mineral levels, um, you know, microbiome in the gut, inflammation, you know. So just to give you a stat, the eyes and brain make up 2% of the body weight and use 25% of the food intake. Wow. Write that 25% down. 25% of the 2% of the body weight. The eyes are too, I'll remember it. 20, the eyes and the brain make up 2% of the body I'm weight brain. and use 25%. 25% of the food is, and so this is where all those great vitamin A, see, I think of vitamin A um, supplementation with health with cornea, you know, um, and you could do that in a general eye vitamin, like put them on my eye vitamin or, you know, find a, in other words, no. he needs more eye nutrients. Um, you know, we haven't really talked about that. And that's that's going to take longer that's not like a quick fix but i wonder if this is brewing for a while on a biochemical level and i agree i, I i'm still a, it's not that i'm skeptical but it just sounds odd to me because when i work with kids with keratoconus we know very early something is off like there's a screening even a nurse, a school screening or pediatrician, oh, that left eye is not seeing as well, go for an exam. So this is macro now, we're, we're in the big picture. The, the, the micro is, my suggestion is go to Baskin and Palmer and Baskin and Palmer and figure out what the eye thing, get, get a definitive second diagnosis, work on that scleral lens if that's, uh, you know, if they offer that. And then on the macro, um, I'm just going to speak from my experience because I've seen, worked with a lot of Spectrum kids. There are two things going on here that I'm questioning. Number one, it's the imprint of what happened at the birth process. And there's an imprint that the infant gets in their nervous system. And then the second imprint, which it can be, again, overwhelming, is all those inoculations at once. And there's also a toxicity factor around that as well, depending on what's in those. So the two things that you can do to say, release any residual uh, imprints that I feel might be influencing him, even though he's much, he's older now, would be number one, look for a, a, a type of therapy called craniosacral therapy. Yeah, well, yes, it'll be very, I, I'm a cranial therapist and um, with the craniosacral, what that could do is that might be able to start touching that stim, that self stim and that all that stuff that you're seeing because his nervous system, there's something out of balance there with that, that he's not able to regulate and self-regulate. You know, a place you could really kind of zero in on is the Upledger Institute in on the east coast of Florida. Hi. Uh, I trained there and they could handle they could handle him in a way like Baskin Palmer, but it would be in this other genre. The cranial work could have a really positive effect on his brain and his nervous system and help uh, release some of those early things that may have been and even in the eye part of that as well. That's number one. And number two, I would keep your eyes open to see if there's somebody you could go to to get him explored in the area of heavy metal toxicity and dietary absorption. Now, you're not going to find this in the GI specialist. It's going to be a naturopath. It's going to be a, a functional medicine person, somebody who can see the whole person like I'm talking to you about. With those inoculations that early, they do put, you know, uh, mercury and thimerosal and all kinds of 
things. And it's overwhelming for an infant to have to process that. And it can contribute to spectrum disorder situations. I know the allopathic people poo poo it. They say there's no correlation, but I've seen it hundreds, thousands of times this story. And when I test with hair mineral analysis, I find levels of mercury and arsenic and things like that, that when they chelate out of the body, it's a different child. And with what you're telling me, those things I think are still influencing him, but you're not going to get that information from any kind of mainstream medical. You're going to have to look and Florida does have integrative alternative practitioners. And that's more of his his tune as well. I mean, there are things like sound therapy where you, you listen to different tones yep. and that can actually release the brain and yes. create, right? The, yeah, Tomatus is one that comes to mind. Who is it? And I actually, it's called the Tomatus method, T-O-M-A-T-I-S. Okay. He's a French physician. Tomatus. And he found that giving kids different frequencies Nowadays, practitioners can have the person talk and through the voice, they can tell what frequencies they're not hearing or they're not processing. That's how sophisticated it's come, become. And in the spectrum disorders, they do much better in these frequency uh, modalities. Um, so I, if it was my child, I would certainly investigate that because I think those things are influencing him at some level. And, um, you know, and then you're covering all the bases. You are going to the best eye specialist. It's going to be medical and it's going to be, you know, straight and narrow. And again, we can, we can talk afterwards and, and see what's the best option. But as a summary, I would not touch that right eye. And I would just get the diagnosis in the left eye and see about getting a contact lens on there to improve the optics and then go from there. In this next segment, the dad is asking me about prescriptions. And we've been talking about putting a contact lens on the left eye. We call it that a scleral lens. And you could also put some glasses over the contact. So you'd wear a little prescription on the right eye with the glasses and then the left eye would just be window glass and then he'd have that contact lens right on the cornea. So there's a lot of ways to prescribe lenses and here's my feedback. Of course, of course, yeah. Yeah. you know, again, it's going to be, it's going to need to be a creative eye doctor that is willing to, do, I mean, I would do it. Um, in fact, what he could do is get a pair of glasses the left lens could be just window glass with the yeah. blue protection yep. and the right lens blue would correct him and the blue protect. And then you would do a contact lens on the left eye. Absolutely. That's a great, great option. Sure. Right. Sure. Of course. Okay. But it's going to take, you know, again, it's got to be somebody that, that you can work with. Some of these eye people, they're very, um, they're very closed to input from the patients you know they have their way we're doing this blah 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 and you need to find somebody a little maybe a woman maybe you need to women tend to be a little more open than men so that they can work with you creatively oh there's all kinds of lens combinations um i've worked with a lot of kids who needed cataract surgery and i had to put a contact lens on that eye and so that they would see and then we would do glasses over that you know and the, the contact lens was an extended wear lens that they slept in. Um, so there's all kinds of ways to do it, but you've got good people there. And where I can be helpful is look at the, I can look at the results. I can look at the topography, help you there. I can guide you, I can counsel you. And um, you know, in the worst, worst, worst case scenario, and this would be more in the physical therapy, you could come out here and, you know, I could do a little physical therapy with him from that spectrum disorder perspective. But let's keep that in our back pocket and see if you can get this solved. I mean, I actually think if you can get a scleral lens on the left eye, 
that's gold and get them to see pretty well out of it you're good you're good you you won't need to do much more and then this other stuff i'm talking about mom that's kind of up to you if you're feeling intuitively that this resonates yeah i mean it's 100 percent. i think yeah I, i was trained in a developmental model so i looked at kids developmentally that's why i asked you about gestation birth bonding those are critical for sensory motor integration ot's don't tend to look at the big picture developmentally now the ot's i work with do but there's primitive reflexes that you can that's a whole therapy that opens up the brain it's movement patterns um you know sensory motor integration from a developmental point of view but if you go to a regular ot i agree you're not going to get very far and so you go well what is this this is nothing so one of the things i love doing when i have a session like this is to keep digging history wise and you've heard in previous segments that this child is on the spectrum and there are some developmental delays there were some challenges at birth and he does some things called visual stimming and he also angles his eye so he's looking out of the corner of his eyes and i give some reasons why he may be doing that and these behaviors are definitely adding to the visual stress that he's going through. Two things. I think it's some kind of eye trauma and brain trauma. And um, when a child does that, um, they're, they're trying to manage a traumatic imprint in their brain and in their eyes. And, you know, when you get an epidural, there's a disconnect between you're not feeling and so there's a disconnect between you and your child um so it could have been at that time it could have been the vaccine vaccination thing um you know again hard to say we'd have to do more if i felt the cranial rhythm in in his head there may be the bones are adjusted in a way that again, he's got to do that, that kind of viewing um, to overcome um, some impediment that he's dealing with. I make a few more comments before the end of the session. I'm a firm believer that craniosacral therapy is very helpful at releasing these early influences, gestation, birth, and bonding interferences in our sensory motor development. So I talk about craniosacral therapy. I talk about the negative effects of staring at a screen all day because this boy really likes to work at the screen. And so here we go. You see, there's a cranial rhythm that the cerebral spinal fluid feeds the brain and the eyes. And that cranial rhythm occurs when there's a a wave motion, if you see my hands. Yeah. And the and and skull. that probably yeah. needs to be really yeah, slow and uh, symmetrical and alive. And that probably needs to be cultivated. Um, and that has an effect on behavior. It has effect on choices. And, you know, I got to say, looking at a screen all day feeds that compression. Exactly. So it's feeding in. And maybe that that has affected the circulation of the cornea, which has created, you know, this corneal starvation. I would look more in that area uh, also. And, um, you know, I know where you are on the West Coast to try to go to the East Coast. But, you know, if you, even if you contact the Upledger Institute, um, I like them better than Nova. Uh, and I went to Upledger. Um, they could probably help you, even if you said, do you know some practitioners in your local area, um, okay. and I would I would follow that thread. I think there's something there that could be very opening. And as a spectrum disorder, we do craniosacral on all the kids. They yeah. all get it, and it makes a huge difference. I think at this point, go go to BP, see what they say, and then you know let's talk after that if you're unclear about what to do. But I think your your track is a good one, and uh, they will be able to meet you. Uh, very well, and then you'll know uh, what the next steps are. But um, no surgery, 
don't touch the right eye. No. And um, let's just take the next steps and see what, what what's the best thing for your son. So to put an exclamation point on this, it's very important in keratoconus that number one, you get a definitive diagnosis. Number two, you're doing some corneal topography. You're getting some initial data on how the cornea looks. And then I would use a contact lens first to see if you can improve the visual acuity and then do some dietary nutritional things, do some vision therapy, and then maybe even some deeper things because they're, because of this is a spectrum disorder child, things like craniosacral, functional medicine, and uh, start there. So that's our show for today. Again, if you want to contact me, you can send your questions to hello at drsamburn.com or you can text me at 1-844-932-1291 and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something from the iClarity podcast show today. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to subscribe on iTunes or Spotify and leave a review. See you here next time.